I want to begin by thanking uh, some of our worship team leaders who were very responsive this last uh, week as I put out the theme for the sermon today. And I'm not going to be able to give credit all the way through the sermon, but this sermon is heavily influenced uh, by uh, not only Scripture and uh, God's Holy Spirit, but by the wisdom of this community and its worship leaders. So I've been thinking about Independence Day a lot this last week. Having a little time off is a dangerous thing for me, right? Uh, allows me to think a little more deeply and a little more fully. And it's lifted up for me some questions, some faith questions that I think perplex believers and non-believers alike, which is to say those of us who are well-churched or familiar with church and those who are not. And I think the fundamental question that arises for me uh, as we hear the text that we heard today from the Apostle Paul, as we celebrate uh, the independence of our nation, um, is the, the fundamental human question, do I need God? Do I need God? I mean, if we have all this freedom, all these liberties that we celebrate, is there really a need for God? Do I need the power and the possibilities that this so-called God might provide for me? In a culture that idolizes the wealthiest, the most famous, and the most powerful, in a nation that has literally tamed the powers of the atom, it seems a fair question. What powers could the Almighty Divine have that we are not already masters of? Well, if there's any topic that the Bible talks about and addresses fully, it's this theme of freedom and whether or not we are too free to need God. From the epic story of the Exodus, you know, the story of the Hebrew people being uh, taken, being, being ushered out of the bondage of slavery in Egypt and under Pharaoh's power into the, the promised land, to the liberation that Jesus brought to so many people. Freedom from the bondage of disease and torment and helplessness. The Bible is all about freedom. And over 200 years ago, this nation both fought and thought its way out of the tyranny of the oppressive rule of the British. It's hard for American citizens today, for you and me, to really take this compulsive need for freedom and liberation seriously when it seems like we have been basking in it for centuries. Although the haunting words of Sojourner Truth and Frederick Douglass in the middle of this time period remind us that maybe it's not all cause for celebration. So I ask the question, is America, are we really free? Bear with me for a moment with some statistics. In 2008, the New York Times reported, for the first time in our nation's history, more than one in a hundred American adults were behind bars, were incarcerated. In the previous year, 1.6 million people were in prison, and another 723,000 people were in local jails. That adds up to almost one in a hundred. And incarceration rates for Hispanic adults is one in 36. For African American adults, it's a shocking one in 15. Can you get your mind wrapped around that? And as of 2009, America had the highest incarceration rate. Rate, not numbers. We know numbers, but rate in the world with 743 out of 100,000 of our citizens behind bars, 
it's a little difficult to proclaim our freedom when so many of us are in prison. So I ask the question again, is America really free? Or are we really free? The U.S. Center for Disease Control reported that in 2010, diabetes affected 25.8 million people, which is 8.3% of the United States population struggles with diabetes. Diabetes is the seventh leading cause of death in the United States. I know many of us here today are struggling with this disease of diabetes. Some of us are on meds, some of us just have to work on our diet, and some of us know that it's down the pike because of family history. Diabetes is becoming more and more common in the United States. From 1980 through 2010, the number of Americans with diagnosed diabetes has tripled. Freedom, this glorious freedom that we sing about, seems a little less complete when so many of our sisters and brothers are threatened with such a debilitating illness. One more, one more, just, just to make my point. Is America really free? Are we really free? The lifestyle of almost every single one of us, even those of us who are as socially conscious as we can be, is dependent upon the availability of energy. How many of us craved this last week a place that had air conditioning? How many of us worry that we would have one of those power outages that we've heard from the Northeast at exactly the wrong time? We are very dependent upon it. In 2008, the United States consumed 23% of the world's petroleum. Fossil fuel, which is petroleum and coal, is a limited resource at least at the rate we're using it, by all estimations, whether we're talking about 10 years, 100 years, or 500. And we know that the results of using these particular resources are damaging to our environment, from the smokestacks and coal burning um, energy centers to the fumes that come out of the back of our cars. Even my sweet little hybrid car still produces fumes that affect the environment. The bells of freedom don't seem to ring quite so clearly when our chosen and delighted lifestyle seems so fragile. And I could go on, you could go on with any other number of stories and images of, of bondage and dependence and captivity that we Americans and in fact our world is involved in. From drug addictions to smoking to depression and materialism, our freedoms go only so far. So, to answer the question, do we need God, we must answer, yeah, duh. We surely need something or someone that is larger, that is more powerful than us to free us from this bondage that we experience. We need a power greater than ourselves. Our sisters and brothers who are in recovery say this each time they meet. We need a power greater than ourselves that can lead us really out of slavery into a true and uncompromised liberty. One that Sojourner Truth, Frederick Douglass, and each one of you would be proud to proclaim. But if our experience with the great freedom movements of history, whether it be the exodus out of Egypt, the independence of America from Europe and England, or the civil rights movement of the 20th century, if we're honest with ourselves, we must acknowledge that just fixing the physical or the legal circumstances isn't enough. Just taking the Hebrew people out of slavery didn't do it because you and I know the story too well. Almost before the Red Sea waters calmed down, they were whining and complaining and wishing 
they were back in slavery where at least they could plan on a regular meal, even if they did have to work themselves to death to get it. We know that in America, from the examples I just gave and the words that we heard earlier, maybe more in bondage now than ever before. Not now to European royalty who wear funny wigs. Oh, we have laws on the book that prohibit discrimination. And get me uh, correct on this, those laws are exceptionally important, and I'm glad we fought for them. But we're almost more racially segregated and segregated in so other, so many different ways than ever before. And it's not that these movements weren't important, they just weren't the ultimate solution to bring freedom and liberation. We've got to change something, and you and I both know it's deep. We've got to change something that's more than just laws or behaviors um, or policies and procedures. We've got to change something that's substantial, something that, that, that's going to make us risk everything inside here. Something that really gets at the heart of liberation and freedom. And we know what that change has to be. It's changed hearts. The hardest thing to change of all. I read a beautiful article online this week. I posted it on Facebook for those of you who follow. Writer Christian De La Huerta writes about freedom and what true freedom is. To be truly free, he writes, means learning how to keep our hearts open. He doesn't use the word vulnerable, but you hear it in every word he writes. He says freedom means knowing that we are greater than our bodies, we are more than our thoughts and our emotions, we're greater than our DNA, our addictions, our traumas, our conditioning from childhood, greater than our perceptions and the circumstances of our lives. We are bigger than all that. It's a pretty tall order. The kind of freedom that De La Huerta talks about is the kind of freedom that demands us to give up something. To give up our obsession. And for Americans, I, I honestly think it's our obsession with being comfortable. Our obsession with being easy. For things to be easy. And our obsession with things being superficially gratifying. Let me tell you a story. This last week I had the opportunity for the first time to go to... Uh, Chautauqua. The Chautauqua Institution is this amazing institution where people, mostly people of faith, but lots of people get together and talk and think about the most important issues of the day. And this last week was about the 2012 election. And one of the surprises I had, I didn't really expect this, but the CEO of our own university hospital was there. And he gave the best illustration of this giving up of something precious in order to receive true liberation and freedom that I've ever heard, and certainly heard from a chief executive of one of the largest institutions that I know about, university hospitals. We were talking about the healthcare uh, reform and the fact that um, uh, the chief justices, or the, 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 the Supreme Court justices, upheld uh, the, the act, the Affordable Care Act. Uh, and he was very honest with us about saying that reform had to happen, and in this act there are a lot of things that are great reforms, but he said there's a lot of things that aren't there that we're just going to have to be honest about. And one of the things he said really struck me, and it struck me because he used himself as a personal example. He said, we're going to have to give up this comfortable notion, this easy notion, this kind of knee-jerk notion, that all of health care is at our beck and call. Because the only way to do that is for you to have it, and not many other people. Because that's a tall order. He talked about health care costs throughout Americans' lifetime. And for most of us, and I don't remember the exact numbers, it's up until like the age 50, we really use only about $5,000, $8,000 a year in healthcare costs, actually use them. Average. 
And in the next 10 or 15 years, it ups to 20. But in the last 20 years of our lives, we used a huge amount of health care, $56,000, $70,000. And what he said is it's almost always in the last few days of our lives because we feel we have the freedom for our loved ones that at that last moment, no cost is too prohibitive, no expense is too much, no measure is too uh, obscure to use on our loved one to keep them alive. And what that does is, it costs us all. Here's his personal example. He got that call in the middle of the night while he was away from the doctor in the emergency room saying, your father is here and he's dying. I know that you are far away. We will put your father on life support until you get here. Now his knee-jerk reaction was absolutely, I want every moment for my father to be alive. Even though there was no brain activity, there was no chance of him surviving, his gut reaction was keep him alive. But he had, after years and years and years of begging his father to tell him what to do, finally had his father say, you know, I don't want to be kept alive on a machine. If you know I'm gone, son, let me go. So in that most painful moment of a child talking about a parent, he said, no, take my father off life support knowing he would never have that last moment by the bedside. A practical man knew he'd given up one of the freedoms that we have, mostly, is demanding our loved ones beyond life support. And he also knew that the longer his father, who had no chance of surviving, was on, that meant there was resources and money and time and expertise not available for someone who might survive. It's the kind of freedom that Jesus lived and Paul preached. This kind of freedom doesn't begin with a desire for more power, but actually is a freedom that begins by giving up power, giving away power, in order to free others from bondage and thereby freeing ourselves. This kind of liberation begins and ends in admitting our weakness, our vulnerabilities, that ultimately we are powerless over the things that control our lives. Freedom, true freedom, is simply God's gift of grace in which we find our strength. And freedom is not in anything we do. Oh, we try to manufacture strength and power, but self-manufactured strength more often than not destroys us rather than heals us. The words that Scott sang from the song that I asked him to, from Anybody Can Whistle. The words are just so beautiful. Someone who wants so desperately to do this which everybody else can do, whistle, uses it as an illustration for much larger things. Maybe, maybe you can show me, maybe you can show me how to let go. Maybe you can show me how to lower my guard. Maybe you can show me how to be free. Each one of us as individuals must assess how to understand and incorporate the sense of weakness, vulnerability, and openness. I can't tell you where you need to be vulnerable, and I don't want you telling me, but we all need to be telling each other. Power, perfect power, comes through weakness. In the words of the Apostle Paul, we must accept that which the world sees as the thorn in our flesh, our Achilles heel, our buttons, our soft spots. Now, we have a choice here. When we figure out what our vulnerabilities are, what our weaknesses are, we can either let these thorns in our flesh tie us in place, burden us, like a, a deep anchor that just holds us down under the water if we let them. Or we can allow these thorns in our flesh, these weaknesses, to prod us on past them, to deal with them so that they're not what defines who we are. And by acknowledging our so-called weaknesses, 
witnesses, and not just believing God's going to do something, but expecting God will use our weakness and work through them for a greater good. If we believe that, if we expect that, the thorn in our flesh will be exactly what Christ needs in order for us to connect with those with whom God has called us to serve and teach and preach and live. Now let's make this a little more pointed because just last week we commissioned new leaders here at Franklin Circle Christian Church. And who would you expect to lead you into freedom and to show power than the leaders of your church? As Paul knew well, when one is called to leadership, one becomes the target of expectations and disappointments. Leaders are most often to bring liberation to the people through the kind of power that the world shows, strength and glory and wealth. Paul was criticized for not showing that kind of leadership. His rival leaders were showing it. How come you aren't like Apollos? Look, look at all the amazing things he's doing. We're expected to, as pastors and as lay leaders, to look like like bodybuilders and television evangelists and um, uh, superstars all the time. But God chooses different gifts, ones that we could never ever boast in, to work through us. Paul knew this all too well. We don't know what his thorn in the flesh was, and people have speculated as in everything from him being as ugly as sin to Paul being gay. I don't give a crap about any of those theories. All is he knew he was vulnerable and that God through Christ was working through that vulnerability for the glory of God and the greater good. And by all accounts, the Apostle Paul was pretty successful. Paul clearly and forthrightly acknowledges really for all generations forevermore his weaknesses, but he doesn't wallow in them. Rather, he challenges us to understand true strength is different from perceived strength or demonstrative strength. Paul sees the big picture and knows the true measure of success. The proof is in the pudding, we say, or to use Jesus' words, by your fruit they will know you. By your fruits you shall know them. And the truly greatest people in history knew this fact well. The nonviolent resistance of Mahatma Gandhi and Martin Luther King Jr. are perfect examples of power made real through weakness. They were ridiculed, not just by the majority, but by their own friends and co-workers in the struggle because they saw nonviolence as being the weakest, most pathetic way to stand up to the injustices of our time. And we all know as Gandhi walked to the sea to get his own salt and not be dependent upon the industries of salt, he turned the tide of the nation of India. As Martin Luther King Jr. was willing to stand up against dogs and fire hydrants and uh, bombing attacks, he knew that Christ would be made real in his life through his vulnerability. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to look at the state of the world right now, whether we're looking at the superpower known as the United States or the world, that we need God. We need a power greater than ourselves to free us from all that binds us. We need liberation like never before by, by grasping onto the power, clinging to the strength as defined by the world will be the last thing that brings us freedom. The freedom we want, the freedom we need, the freedom we long for. In the greatest irony of life, we must give up power. Let go of the things of the world. Hand over our very selves to receive the greatest power known in the universe. The power of God that brings true freedom. And then, when we get that, we can proclaim the greatest mystery of the faith. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, that though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as a thing to be exploited, but emptied himself, 
taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. On a cross. For at last, for at last, that God Almighty will be free at last.